Hello and welcome to The Sacred. My name is Elizabeth Oldfield, and this is a podcast about our deepest values, the stories that shape us, and the people behind the positions in our public conversations. Every episode, I speak to someone who has some kind of public voice or platform about what they hold sacred, from journalists to garden designers, politicians to faith leaders, academics to artists. My hope is that by listening attentively in a non-combative way to a huge range of people, I can grow in empathy and understanding, and maybe you can too. In this episode, you'll hear a conversation I had with Arifa Akbar. Arifa is the chief theatre critic of The Guardian. She's also a trustee of the Orwell Foundation and has been a judge for the UK Theatre Awards and the Women's Prize for Fiction, amongst others. She is also author of Consumed, about the life and early death of her sister from TB. We spoke about why choice and freedom are sacred to her, her spiritual engagement with Islam, the delicacy of telling other people's stories, and the power of the arts. Arifa is, like me, quite an articulator when she speaks, so you might occasionally hear a bit of banging on her desk, but I think you will very much enjoy listening anyway. Arifa, we are going to jump right in into the deepest of the deep ends uh, with no warm-up chat. Uh, but before I ask you what you think you might hold sacred, which you've had a bit of warning about, I would just want, I'm curious to how the, word, how the word lands with you. Is the word sacred something that you feel very comfortable with or drawn to, or does it feel a bit foreign, off-putting? What are the resonances? Mm. I think sacred is a really powerful word. Um, I think it's got associations with religion, um, which are, feel, I feel are wrong. <laughs> um, yes, it relates to religion, but it relates to humanness as well. Um, so, so I think those are that you know, while it has the spiritual resonance, which I think is is uh, interesting and important for some people. Uh, you don't have to be religious to hold something sacred. Obviously, that feels like a very obvious thing to say, but it's also important because I think it, it in some ways, it, it could be divested of those religious uh, connotations and stand alone as a as a profound and important thing in itself. Yeah, I very much, um, I very much agree. It's one of we have a very very wide range of guests, religious, non-religious, and in asking it is it is uh, we hope to. to sh- to demonstrate or surface the fact that we all have these very deep principles that when they're pressed on, we might react strongly. They might be shared or not shared, but it's a way really of getting, getting below the small talk and the immediate and the urgent to what's really driving us and what, what um, the things we, we at least try to live our life around or aspire to. So what came up for you having sat with that question for a while? What do you think you might hold sacred or what might your sacred values be? It's interesting that question in itself is is isn't it funny how we go through life never re- you know not necessarily having consciously decided what is sacred and what our purpose is and what our principles are but I think you sort of know them and work by them anyway. Um, I think what I one of the things I hold most sacred is is freedom personal freedom. And choice, and that's also always been incredibly important to me. Um, me personally, you know, in the in the sense that uh, I think, you know, my mother sort of infused that sense of you know personal choice and freedom for her daughters, um, and then and then for society. So I think it works on both those levels: uh, freedom, freedom, and choice. Um, but there's other things I hold sacred, you know. Um, the sacred principles, you know, living by kindness and giving and generosity, those things for me are incredibly important in society. If we're talking about what I think, you know, is important in society. Yeah. Those are some chunky themes and I'm sure we'll see as we go through maybe um, some of those threads will will circle back. But I do want to, to start at the beginning really to get a sense of your childhood. And I usually frame that question as, uh, start with some formative, are there any formative ideas, and they might be religious or political or philosophical, that you feel have really shaped you, and we'll go from there. Well, as I say, freedom and, and choice was incredibly important. You know, we were given, we were told again and again to do what mattered to us as children, and we didn't know that was a bit confusing and a bit perplexing. 
So we'd go to our parents and say, what GCSEs or what A-levels do you think we should do or what kind of careers should we take up, as children do. And they didn't really guide us in that. They didn't direct us. My mother didn't. And and um, and we'd often go to her. And she all she'd say is her mother had been a teacher and, and I think her mother had sort of been really important in her life. Um, and she sort of, my mother just said, um, you know, you, you find what's important for you to do. But but there was a re- really keen sense of you really don't need to do the thing that you're supposed to do. So you don't have to be a wife. You don't have to be a mother. You don't have to follow, you know, convention because you're supposed to follow convention. That's what I mean by freedom and choice. So you don't really need to be a woman in the sense that you're being asked to be in society. And really, there's a sort of silent demand on us as women to do be certain things. And I think that's what I remember my mother making plain that we didn't need to be. Do you, where do you, well, no, let me think about, do you think that she, I feel like that would be reasonably unusual for mothers, for that generation yeah, of women yeah. in any culture, but coming from Pakistan, what, why do you think she was able to hold that? Or was it precisely well, because of that? N- no, because her family was, they were fu- was full of really um, women with a lot of freedom and, and, you know, they were highly educated and they did stuff and, you know, as well as being the mothers and wives that perhaps society demanded them to be. And not all of them were mothers and wives, but she just came from a family, a very well-educated family who had um, where where the women worked or they were very arty. And my and her mother worked. Her mother was a teacher for all of her life, even, you know, be, alongside being a mother. So it was really going to be all about choice and freedom for both her girls and her boy. She had you know, my, my sister and I and my brother, and we were given exactly the same rules for life. So go out there and make your own choices. You know, she almost, they almost didn't help us make those choices, which at the time I resented myself. And there were certain things she didn't, she insisted she wouldn't teach us like cooking. So I couldn't, we couldn't, and we loved the idea of cooking and also cleaning and, you know, sort of fitting into that gender um, type and she she refused to teach us and there was you know there was tension there um and I suppose it is it was different I didn't think it was different then I didn't think um she was giving us feminist values in, in any way I thought she was just giving us the right to choose and but also the responsibility to, to make all those choices and I think the responsibility weighed me down then but now I see it as as a right to, to live the way I want to live. There was no suggestion that, you, you know, you had to grow up and get married. There was no suggestion that you had to grow up and have children. You just had to find a life that was uh, important to you, meaningful, F- had yeah. to find your own meanings. So it's quite an adult thing to do as a child, to find your own meanings. And and we were brought up as Muslims, but again, and, you know, we were taken off to the mosque, but not not much. And we saw my my mother pray because she's devout. My my father isn't really devout. He'd occasionally pray. Um, but we weren't pushed to do any of that. You know, we were encouraged and we all considered ourselves Muslim and I consider myself Muslim now, but I don't have Muslim ritual in my life where she does. Tell me a little bit more about that experience. You've written about shuttling back and forth a little bit between London and Lahore and then a, an eventual permanent move. What was the experience of that like? That was really traumatic, I think. Yeah, that, the dislocations in that move as a very small child. I was born in London and then I think at about two, two and a half years of age, my parents decided to take us back to uh, Lahore, to their bigger extended family, my grandparents, paternal grandparents' home. My my sister was older than me um, and my brother was younger. So all three of us were born. Um, we moved back to, to Lahore. I don't really remember being up to the age of two in London, but I do remember Lahore very vividly. So I think I went there maybe Sorry, no, I was three I was three years old when we left London and I was five when we returned. So we stayed there or you know, two and a half years we stayed in the hall. And 
those years were wonderful because we had the extended family. We had a lot of um, color and noise in, in a very big um, home in, in Lahore where we all live, we live together with uncles and aunts and grandparents and cousins. And there was, a, there's a lot of nature around us. There was, a, there were other children we could play with. There were no real rules. We didn't, I don't remember seeing very many adults. I played with the other children than my grandfather, who was sort of having early on, he, I think he was in the first stage of Alzheimer's, but, but really having fun with the children. We, we, we really clung to him. Um, and there were animals around and nature. So that part of my, and, and Urdu was spoken obviously in the home because we were in Lahore. So I didn't learn to speak English. I didn't learn to read or write, you know, before coming back to London at the age of five. I didn't know a word of English. But we left law because there were tensions in the family. My uncles um, had found work and security and were adding to the running of the household. And my my father didn't do that, hadn't done that. He hadn't found a you know, job in a position in Lahore. So once again, they, they we were taken back to London. And really this time we landed in London, we were really we thrown into poverty, you know, and we found ourselves living in this terrible home. It was a sort of, we were homeless basically, and we lived in a awful one room squat type thing for the six months. And then we were found by Campton Council and given a, a home in Primrose Hill, a council house, in, a flat in Primrose Hill. And we grew, those years were hard. I remember those years um, as really sad and frightened years where all the certainty had been taken away, all the family love and connections had been removed. And we'd suddenly become become a very small unit. Before we move on, I just want to go back to um, that lived experience of Islam and the way that relates to choice and that and that time. And even as I'm asking it, and the, some of the context is on this podcast, I talked to lots of people and really want to work at listening across difference and building empathy. Um, the voices that people might not naturally listen to, or perhaps they have an understanding of a particular position in society, but don't know some of the many people behind those positions. But I think why I'm hesitating is you've written beautifully about actually being a kind of public Muslim female writer and how easy it is for the questions that you get asked to kind of exoticize or bring with them the baggage of assumptions, even in the questions. So I, I just want to name that really and say, I'd love to hear completely in your own words about your journey with the faith, because you've said you were brought up in it, that it was light touch and you would call yourself a Muslim now. Now, what happened in between? Has it been very steady and stable all the way through? Have you kind of moved away and back from that part of yourself? No, I mean, I think what, what I learned from my mother very early on is that there's, there's a, a religion as an institution with all its books and all its rituals. And then there's spirituality and there's just your very private beliefs that are very private and might not be um, expressed in words even though they're so private. And those are feelings more than anything. And that's a relationship that doesn't relate, to, that, that, that's separate from the institution of religion. So I think I've kept that distinction, very, very clear distinction between actually, you know, religion and, and faith. <laughs> and they are distinct. And I, you know, I know plenty of people with a very keen sense of religion, with no sense of God, uh, and they'll admit it. And they like the religion, and they like being part of a community. And they feel sometimes they feel they need to be, you know, across the faith. I think they, they have been brought up. I wasn't brought up like that at all. Um, my Lahore family, I don't remember any sort of ritual, religious ritual at all, but, you know, we were immersed in a culture that had the call for prayer and there was a sort of religion in the backdrop there. Um, we didn't absorb it as children. We observed it, you know, it was there as part of daily uh, life. Um, and then... I suppose when we came here, we were much more removed from the religious rituals. Um, and over the years, my 
I, I watched my mum and dad take part in those rituals. And of course, we'd celebrate Eid and, you know, there was no alcohol in the house and we ate halal food. And I still eat halal food now and I still don't drink alcohol. And there are things that I keep to because that's how I grew up and it keeps me close to my um not community, because I'm not part of any community, and we never were. We were very isolated, as I say, we were this tiny unit. We didn't have a, a Muslim Asian, there, there wasn't a big immigrant Asian community or a Muslim community in North London where we lived. We grew up very much as alone in that sense and not connected. We did, didn't have any bigger family around, so we couldn't be Muslims together. And so much of faith, so much of religion is doing things together, isn't it? Being part of the same mosque, um, you know, doing rituals together, sharing that. And we didn't have that. I think I'm just not drawn to bigger communities of religious communities because we didn't grow up in them. And I, as I say, I really like the idea of freedom and choice. And I'm sometimes I find those big religious communities of every faith really quite stultifying. That's just because I think I've had the background that I've had, where I've been allowed to make all my own choices around values, rather than just abide by religious values and think, well, I've, I've been, these are edicts from on high, and that's what I'm going to observe. Um, so I think I don't want to do that. So I probably have a little bit of a problem with following religion sort of devoutly because I think it's blindly, but that doesn't mean that I hold it in high regard and I still abide by certain values in, in and certain practices in Islam, like eating halal and all the rest of it. Um, and, you know, to my dying day, I'll define myself as a Muslim. And if I'm ever in a desperate spot... I'll say a little Quranic prayer, you know, if I'm concerned for somebody, if somebody's dying, if somebody's very ill, that's what I hold important. And it's funny in those times how important religion becomes and ritual becomes, actually. So, you know, when my sister died five years ago, the funeral in Regent's... Um, um, at the at the mosque at, at Regent's Park was really important. It was a profound ritual. And that's what we could cling, you know, that's what we could hold to. And that's when I think Islam, you know, or, or Christianity or Judaism gives you great ballast, I think, you know, and, and those prayers are very meaningful in those situations. Um, so I was really pleased to be a Muslim. Tell me about your sister then and this beautiful and painful story you've been telling. How long did you sit with a desire to, to write about that before you felt able to? Or was it a reasonably quick and obvious part of your grieving for her? Mm, no, it wasn't. Um, because I didn't think that my grief held very many profound thoughts. I'd read a lot of... Um, amazing grief memoirs and not for a minute did I want to write a grief memoir. So when my sister died in 2016, she died quite suddenly and she was undiagnosed until the day after she'd had a brain hemorrhage. And the only then, a day later, when we knew she was, she was dying, she died, they diagnosed her with TB, which was incredibly horrifying because it was a, it had they diagnosed her in time, it's just cured. It's an ancient illness. It could have been cured with antibiotics but it wasn't and she died um, and there was the horror of that medical um, too late diagnosis and we were appalled by, by her doctors and we didn't get a proper written explanation until months later we kept asking for it and we didn't get it and I think my impulse was to write about that more than anything my impulse was to uh, explain that to myself and to the world. How could this happen, you know, in a very big leading North London hospital? How on earth could this happen? And as a journalist, if something like that happens, the first thought is to tell the world, to write it down, to do what you do in your work. So it was that that I wanted written down and explained to everybody, including myself. But then I didn't because I thought, 
I left it. I, I, I wasn't sure that I could turn my sister's death into a story. I, I'm not quite sure. You know, you'd have to think really, I would have to have thought really carefully about what I was doing and why I was doing it. Um, if I was grieving, surely I can grieve in private or I can write grief down in my diary. Why did it need to be written into, in a book that went out to the world? Um, so for year, you know, for f- first few years, I had no 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 desire to write write a book about my sister. But the Guardian, I did write a piece for the, you know, I worked for the Guardian and I wrote a piece about my sister. Um, actually, I wrote a piece about my sister and her art. She was an artist, and she'd had years of depression, depression, but she'd just gone back to college, Camberwell College, a few years before she died. She was doing her degree when she died. And she had this fantastic tutor, Kelly, who said, well, we'll put on an exhibition of her work at Camberwell. And I thought, how wonderful. And she said, well, will you write us a little essay about her art for the, pro- for the catalogue? I said, oh, well, OK. And I, I didn't want to because I thought that sounds really very hard. You know, here's my sister just died a few months ago. And I really, the last thing I want to do is write about my sister's death. Uh, um, and even her art, you know, because 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 of, because I could I was just paralysed by grief and shock, a shock at this at the way that her death had happened so suddenly. Um, but I I really thought I'll, I have to do this because this is about my sister's you know art and her exhibition and honouring that. So I sat down and I wrote you know a fairly short piece and. It ran with the catalogue and my friend said, oh, that was a beautiful piece and look at her art, it's beautiful. And it was a really great day, her exhibition and this catalogue within it. And then um, after that, The Guardian used the same piece because it's my newspaper and they used the same piece um, in the paper. And there was a very big response to that. And then a friend said, you should meet my literary agent. And I said, okay, but I had no book in mind. I'd written a novel actually, and it hadn't gone anywhere with another agent. And so I thought I was going to this second agent, my friend's agent, Claire Alexander, who's amazing, just to have a cup of tea and a talk about the failed novel, about the future, maybe me writing something. And in the course of that conversation, I really got on with Claire. I think she's a fantastic person who's an editor as well as he, she's, she's been an edif- editor for years. And she must have had a way about her because I said, oh, well, there is my sister. And she d- died of TB, tuberculosis. And at some point, I'd like to write about her in the context of tuberculosis. And I was very fascinated by the illness because in my naivety, I thought it had gone away. I just thought it was you know, a 19th century thing. There was loads of romance around it. It wasn't there in, in art and, and fiction. And, and, and it was very much something that the contemporary world had controlled and, and defeated. This was me thinking this. And it's not true because it's all over. It's, 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 a pan, it's classed as a pandemic. It's huge in the world um, still. So I had this new knowledge of tuberculosis and, 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 and I'd read around this and, and I realised it was quite a mysterious illness in many ways. It's quite stealthy. It can disguise itself in the body. And I thought, this is an illness that is fascinating, you know, more fascinating, obviously, because my sister died of it and she was undiagnosed by leading doctors. How could this be? And then, of course, have, being a lover of art, um, of the arts, there's such a ri- rich sort of um, catalogue of, t- of tuberculosis, the illness, in paintings, in opera, as I found out, in um, 19th and 20th century fiction, you know. and Even in Moulin Rouge. Even in Moulin Rouge, yeah. And I mean, there's tons of operas with dying tubercular women. There's tons of, of novels that I'd read and I hadn't really clocked how that in the backdrop or in the foreground that, that there's, there's a lot of tuberculosis. And, I, and Claire said, oh, well, you grew up in Hampstead, didn't you? Because if there's a first tuberculosis hospital in Hampstead, she seemed to have this knowledge and turned out her daughter's a TB consultant. There was a whole load of little coincidences like that and everything sort of collected 
and and we we dreamt up this idea of writing a book that wasn't just about here's my grief, you know, because I that's the last thing I didn't invent grief. It's the last thing I wanted to do is write about my grief. But I thought, well, I could write about my sister and our and sisterhood, our our relationship with sisters, but in a far bigger context yeah. of of ill of, of this illness that sh- that that surrounds us in in terms of literature and um, and as a medical mystery as well. Yeah. And tell me about that ethical wrestle that mm, memoir yeah. in particular mm. brings because it's the most sort it's of a, intimate, mm. relational, vulnerable thing where you're. But it's also not directly just your memoir. It's it's someone else's story, Absolutely. and obviously your dad has. Uh, is, yeah. is uh, you know has dementia does, yeah. doesn't really understand it but and your no. and your sister's passed away but exactly mom's around how did you navigate that and I can see you doing it in the prose that wrestle of yeah. how do I tell this story what are my motivations mm. how do I treat this with care and yeah. also tell a good story because ultimately you're a journalist who's just very good at that yeah but actually interestingly your first question about you know sacred what you hold sacred strangely, it does come down to bear on that question you've just asked around, you know, if, if you hold family sacred, but also choice and freedom, there's a lot of potential clashes there in what you hold sacred, um, what you feel you have a right to do, and your, your what is your personal freedom to write about this versus other pe- people's freedoms and, and choices and privacies too. And it was really a hard thing. I think this is why I didn't want to write about a, fa- a you know, grief memoir because I knew I'd have to write about the family bit because you can't really write about your sister's later life without, leave, without the, f- the, the important family dynamics and all the intimacies of that. And the dysfunctions of my particular family, and and the trauma of, you know, um, of some of the the family, the way in which we were brought up, um, I, I really wrestled with it. I wrestled with it before I wrote the book, even while I was writing it. As you say, it's there in that 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 questioning of, is it okay to write this? Is this version of my sister correct, or am I? Is this projection? Um, you know, I've given my father no right of reply because he can't have a right of reply because he's locked in his own world. He's had dementia for over 10 years. Um, so he gets no right of reply. Um, the dead have rights, but, you know, but my sister has no say in a book that's all about her. Would she have approved? Was she alive? Would she have been horrified by the spilling of such intimacies, you know? And so I had all those questions questions going around swirling around and then of course as you say I have my mother who's very much alive and my brother who's very private so there was all that to navigate and I thought well I'm going to write about my uh, version of the family life I'm going to ask permission of my mother and I did and at first she was a little bit reluctant because I said I want to write this book about Fauzi you know I said, oh, sister, but within the bigger context of the mythologies and um, art and medical mysteries around TB. And she liked that idea, but she didn't like the idea of, you know, me exposing her bad marriage, me exposing my sister's depression and eating disorders and, and treatment, you know, difficulties with our father that she had. But then interestingly, my mother started contributing to it. She got very much involved and it was, became a joint project. And, and it is, I think, so, and she gave me stories about, you know, my sister's life before I was born. She told me about how, how bad things were in her marriage and why she couldn't leave. All these questions and puzzles that I couldn't have answered myself. Um, and and I suppose generosity, the things that I said to you at the beginning about those things that are sacred, you know, generosity, kindness, um, those I think I applied to the book. So even when there was an urge to, you know, express some resentments, I thought, well, actually, I'm going to hold back here and not show a judgment because family <coughs> is so... 
you see your family a certain way, but your brother and sister will see it a completely different way. There is actually no one truth, is there? And there's no one version of what happens in a family. Everybody's got their own version. And I wanted to make that plain. And it was partly because I wanted to give people back their versions. I didn't want to say this is how it happened. Um, I just wanted to show a little bit of generosity to the fact that my brother might remember it differently. This might not have been the case for my sister. So I wanted to make that um, explicit in the text. And, and I hope I did. So, so those principles, you're right. You know, I suppose you carry those things principles that you think are sacred you carry them about without ever really naming them or becoming conscious of them but they're there and they guide you I think they guide you in what you do without you realizing yeah one of the big threads in the book is your sister's struggles with her mental health how do you think we're doing as a society on the kind of subject of Mm. mental health it's been transformed Mm. the public conversation about mental health in the last even in the last decade Mm. What's your feeling? Have we made great progress? Are there things to be concerned about? I feel like there's quite a lot of bandwagon jumping maybe, yeah. but maybe that's necessary. Where do you where do you land on it? Well, I agree. I think there's a lot of talking about, you know, one's mental health and anxiety. And I think when we talk and think and talk about serious mental health, mental health, you know, serious depression, I still don't think we talk about that because I think it's a really difficult subject. Um, And my sister certainly didn't find it easy and she didn't find the world sympathetic, actually. She found the world incredibly judgmental. Um, She found um, she was judged wrongly and unfairly. She felt the system wasn't sympathetic, that it wasn't there for her. And I think in reality, I'm not sure how well we're doing there seems to be a whole lot of talk. There seems to be people writing articles. About, and, and that's a good thing because you take some of the sting out of the stick. Well, you, you take some of the stigma away. But I don't think you do take some of the stigma away from serious mental illness and serious depression. People, I just think it's sort of, it is slightly bandwagon stuff. And I worry because I think people are saying, isn't it great that we've sort of solved this? And I don't think we've even begun to actually. Yeah, very mm. much agree. Mm. Um, can't mm. let you go without pulling on the kind of thread that we didn't talk about much in your childhood, but which is very much in the book mm. and defines mm. some of the relationship between you and your sister, which is this, the place of the arts, particularly theatre, but also novels. Where did that come from for you? Um, and then maybe I'll ask what role you think it plays in helping us engage across these differences. We had very limited means, you know, and and we were a poor family so in a way living out living through stories enriched us it was it was a way to live in a bigger way in a richer way so that's why I think I liked um films and books and television stuff on television but I think you know my sister was pretty arty she she was quite she was a talented artist from the beginning as a child so I partly followed her I partly found my own love of books and I think, God, I think you gain, I think the biggest thing you um, learn through art and culture is, is empathy because these stories about are about human beings and how we live and how we love or, or hurt each other and how we can, and how we are in families and, and how we are as people. It's, it's everything there. It's all of religion. You know, everything that religion teaches you is in culture and arts and everything that philosophy teaches is everything, you know, um, books and paintings and films and all the rest of it is a, is a way to see ourselves. It's a way to see the world. It's the way to see, see how we have lived in it and how we are living in it, how we could live in it. So, so it's, so it's everything wrapped in all the dis- disciplines kind of reflected back at us. And I think that's what I like about it. You can learn to be better. You can learn to be a better person, a kinder person. This is a bit of a cheeky um, kind of personal request, but I often mm. come back to the idea that I actually think that the lived experience of faith, that particular thing that you were talking about, that quite private yeah, encounter yeah, that, with God, yeah. is actually remarkable. 
it it shows up less than you would expect in novels, in plays, in films. Mm, often, yeah. often the cultural landscape falls back on quite two-dimensional tropes about religion, whether it's yes. a comedy vicar yes. or an oppressed Muslim woman. Yes. But, you know, you can think about Marilyn Robinson and Graham Greene on the Christian side. But the actual yeah. lived experience of God mm. is largely absent in a way that I am perplexed by. I think, yes. I'd love to hear yes. your, why you think that might You're be. Right. And, and uh, is there any kind of, uh, is there art forms, novels, books, plays that you think reflects a kind of Islamic sensibility in that area mm. that you think mm. does a good job that, you know, I could go read, our listeners could go watch or listen to? Yeah, you're you're so right about that spirituality, which I think is really prof- so. You know, we I've been talking a lot about faith and um, religion and religious community and how it's great some of those rituals, but actually I don't feel really part of it. But and I should have said this earlier, but spirituality and sort of personal faith are really strong in me. So I went to a, a Church of England school, primary school, and I absolutely loved. It didn't matter that it was Christianity. The fact is within Christianity, there's great spirituality. That's what I recognized, you know, take away the religion element. Um, Even looking at stained glass, I found incredibly moving as a child. Um, I found a lot of biblical stories incredibly, you know, intriguing. In fact, what it is, is that all this talk of heaven and hell and angels and devils, it's sort of... um, it has a great imaginative realm that I think is very rich, especially for children. So I felt very um, grateful to have Islam at home with all these otherworldly stories around in the Quran, which actually a lot of them are from the Bible and, and from the Jewish and Christian faiths. And then I had school, I had a lot of Christian stories. Um, and all of that kind of rich imagination, you're right, it sort of disappears when, you, especially when you think, think about novels today, there is spirituality, where does it go? Because I think it is a really potentially uh, rich area to explore. I mean, I think of one book by Hilary Mantel called Beyond Black. And Beyond Black is about a spiritualist who sees the dead you know, among the living. And it's about how she lives with the knowledge of, you know, this other world, crossing the boundaries, seeing the other side, the responsibility of that, you know, contacting the other side. And so there's a novel like that that's very much about um, saying, I mean, it's quite, it's quite an interesting thing because Hilary Mantel's talked about clairvoyancy or... Um, that kind of spiritualism before, but you only get the odd book like that. You're right, the Graham Greens, you know, you have, but you, you don't have a huge tradition of it, do you? I think you see it in visual arts more, even in abstract artists. Like I've always, I remember going to see um, Rothko's paintings in, in New York and the big museum there, and step being absolutely mesmerized by Rothko's paintings because you know those those two-tone paintings those very big Rothko paintings um because there's something incredibly incredibly spiritual in them I think um the other instant I mentioned my book that's related to art and and religion and, and spirituality and faith is um the Sistine Chapel I remember my sister went to the Sistine Chapel when she was 19 years old she'd had her fig, first big bout of depression and She'd made friends with young teenage women, other girls who were part of Opus Dei, which is a Catholic sect of sorts. And they they were all going one Easter to see the Pope. And my sister sort of said, I want to go along. And my mother was so concerned for her because she'd been so depressed. She'd sort of sung, collected enough money to, for the airfare. My sister came back utterly transformed for a while we thought you know Rome had cured her but it wasn't the meeting with the Pope or you know seeing the Pope um but it was a visit to the Sistine Chapel when she saw all of Michelangelo's um art in there and, and it had profoundly moved her so when she died I thought well what, what what 
the Sistine Chapel, what was so great about it? And I, I think I went to find what she saw in there. And it was the most moving experience that I think, I, it was when I lost all my anger um, about over her death and lack of diagnosis and what I saw as just lunacy that the doctors hadn't seen, this outrage, this unfair, the unfairness about somebody having such a hard life and then such an unlucky death. And I'd been told to run on the Vatican City, you know, when you arrive there, run to the Sistine Chapel before it gets filled up. And I remember running to the Sistine Chapel and getting to the mouth of it and then just seeing this life and death drama in all over the walls of the Sistine Chapel, which is very three-dimensional. And it's all about life and death, joy and sorrow, you know, ecstasy and agony, uh, God and the devil, good and evil, it's all in there um, and it's also beautiful, but it's also made me think, you know, life is defined by its opposite, those opposites I've just mentioned, that life is defined by death in some ways, you know, that's what gives it its shape. Um, joy is defined by sorrow and and actually we're a part of it and my sorrow was, was little in compared to this epic sorrow. So it, I sort of, I don't know, I made peace. I could have sat at the Sistine Chapel. It was so moving because I kept seeing what my sister saw, but then I saw so much else. Arifa Akbar, thank you so much for speaking to me on The Sacred. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Sacred. Remember, sharing is caring, as my four-year-old says. So please do send this or another episode to a friend. Rate us on Apple Podcasts or my personal favorite, leave us a review. I really get a thrill when I see a new one pop up. Huge thanks to Abby Allison for research and production support and Emily Down for our visual identity. We are edited by Drew Hawley and our music is composed and arranged by Luke Stanley with vocals by Lizzie Harvey. The Sacred is a project of the think tank Theos, and you can find out more about our work at theosthinktank.co.uk.